Hello, everybody, and welcome to another online seminar presented by Head Acoustics. My name is Jacob Sondergaard, and I will be your host today. Today's topic is going to be about listening effort. Sometimes we call it ABLE, the Assessment of Binaural Listening Effort. And we'll specifically be focusing on automotive and in-vehicle examples. However, if you joined us last month, you'll know that there are plenty of other examples and applications for listening effort use that goes beyond the automotive situation. Nonetheless, we've prepared a slide deck today that goes through a lot of cool stuff. The two things I really want to extract from you right now is the fact that we'll take a fairly intense deep dive look into the structure and function of the listening effort metric and then we'll pull out a few very cool and practical automotive use cases where the listening effort metric is going to be helpful and beneficial for our work. Now before we get into that let me just uh, take a minute or so to explain why we're even doing this today, why we're talking about evaluating listening effort. I think the, the first thing, this is a three-prong explanation. The first one involves the fact that our world today is just simply getting noisier. There's more people, there's more cars and cafes and bars and everything else in between that makes noise. And combined with that increasingly noisy world, we as humans also have this somewhat irrational expectation that the audio and telecommunications equipment that we are using just has to function and not just function but actually function well and perform well in all those different noise scenarios. Now what that leads to is ultimately putting a lot of stress and a lot more demands onto the test equipment to make sure that all this telecommunications on audio equipment gets tested and validated correctly. Um, and until now, there has been no method available that evaluates speech intelligibility or listening effort on the receive side. So the receive side, of course, refers to the side that is picked up by the ears of the head and torso or by the user, of course, of the audio and telecommunications equipment. So no method exists until now that complies with these three following requirements. Number one, it has to be usable with real speech as the stimuli. So none of this, you know, MLS sequences, broadband noise, pure tone stuff, that just doesn't work for modern day telecommunications equipment. So number one, it has to be able to handle real speech stimuli. Number two, the assessment methods has to be able to work in realistic background noise scenarios. So likewise, we can't just assume that a static deterministic pink noise sound field is going to be, first of all, representative of the real world. Number two, put the device in a real world state. We need something that also works with uh, transient in nature, so highly variant in the time domain types of background noise scenarios. And number three, the assessment method has to work from a black box approach. So from a very high level, what we're asking here is that we don't need to take a device and crack it open and tap into it and extract multiple electrical signals along the way. This needs to be something that we can use on commercially available devices, be they headphones, mobile phones, or cars, and simply test them as they are. Now, the wonderful thing is that the Etsy standardization community got together in 2018, 2019, and eventually at the end of November 2019, finalized Etsy TS-103558, which describes the listening effort objective metric as well as the structure for conducting auditory tests, if you are so inclined. Now, actually, in August of 2020, which is very recent as of today, um, the standard was revised to now include multiple different languages and a lot more use cases, basically making it a lot more robust. The general idea with the listening effort metric is that it is a MOS metric that complies with ITUT P800, and that means 
we go from a scale of one to five, one being the worst and five being the best. And we are using something called the DCR, the degradation category rating scale. What that means is we are evaluating the absence of a negative. In other words, when we talk about listening effort, you require a lot of listening effort or a high amount of listening effort. We are, we are also saying it is a low listening effort score. So from a real world scenario, if you're in a situation where you are required to have considerable amounts of effort to understand the other person, that is a lot of effort and that corresponds to a very low score in this case of two. So just be aware of that juxtaposition as we talk about results later on today. Now, I'm going to give you a warning and say the next couple slides here are going to get a little bit involved, but we do want to give you some insight into how the algorithm is structured and how it works. That being said, I don't want this to be considered a intro to how to fool the listening effort metric. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is ask the question, what technical parameters contribute to estimating listening effort? Because if we know that, we'll have a better understanding of what we can better do with our devices to improve the listening effort for real people. Now, before we dive into each of these steps, the first thing I want to point out is the double arrows here indicate binaural signals. And that is a key and crucial element to the listening effort metric. It is binaural, which is the first MOS metric of its kind to handle binaural signals. That's pretty cool. Now, first step or first phase, let's look at what goes into the algorithm. So we're starting with two signals. We have a binaural signal, the degraded signal, which consists of the speech and the noise measured from the ears of the head and torso. And then we have our reference signal, not unlike other MOS metrics. That's the original source signal that is fed into the device, typically electrically, and then presented you know, acoustically into the space. On occasion, we will have the ability to measure a noise-only signal, and that is measured binaurally with the ears of the head and torso when there is no speech present. This is an optional signal. It's what we would consider a helper signal that may make it a little bit easier for the algorithm to calculate the eventual results. Now, the algorithm itself has three different modes. Binaural, and that's the one I really want to key in on because this is the default mode, almost regardless of acoustic scenario. And that's where we have both uh, the degraded signal and the noise-only signals that are captured using the right and the left ear signals. Now, you, you'll notice here that even for a handset scenario or a monaural headset or something where we only have the signal on one ear, the binaural mode is going to capture what is essentially speech plus noise at one side and then noise only on the other side. But that's fine and that's fair because that's also the situation that a real human person would be in and that's what we want to try to assess. What is the listening effort in that situation? We want the binaural signals. Now, there is a monaural mode and we would really recommend you use the binaural, but the monaural mode does exist and the idea here is that we capture the degraded and the noise only signals from the right side. And then the left ear is basically just the noise only signal. There's no speech whatsoever. So it's a little bit of an approximation of the binaural situation with a monaural stimulus. And then we have the diodic use case or mode. And in this case, we're measuring a single signal and we're just duplicating that into two channels. The reason for that is for electrical recordings. And that is because the listening effort metric is standardized and validated for acoustic transmission, which is pretty neat. Now, next phase is we'll do some pre-processing that usually involves some level adjustments and time alignments and things like that. There are Two things that I want to extract from this long list of steps. Number one is we're calculating the ITD, that's the interaural time difference. So the difference in arrival time 
between signals reaching the right ear and the left ear. This is generally very important for binaural applications. That's one of the early steps that we do here. And then later on down, we also take our degraded signal and then we classify it into different classes of activity, high activity, medium activity, and so on. For those of you that are deeply embedded in the telecommunications industry, you might see a lot of similarities to this step with what's taking place in ITUT G160, which is the SNRI metric. It's a similar concept that we're using here. Now, once we've done all this pre-processing pre and early steps, calculation steps, we'll move on to the next phase where we talk about the spectral transformation. And the first step here is we need to feed our signals into a hearing model. In this case, the listening effort metric is using the relative approach hearing model, which is a hearing model that works both in the frequency domain and in the time domain. And that's because those components, both of those aspects are super important to the human hearing ability. And what that hearing model essentially does is act as a data reducer because the whole point later on is we have some machine learning algorithms, that's the buzzword these days, that'll be trained and optimized to detect impairments in the speech signal that are relevant to human perception. So what the hearing model is doing very early on is it's simply looking at the signal to say, how would a human ear or a human hearing system perceive the signal? And I'm gonna read off the slide here, the quote here, if a human cannot hear it, it should not affect the final result. That's really the goal of reducing all the nonsense and whether that masking effects takes place in the frequency domain or it takes place in the time domain just because of the way the human hearing sensation works, it doesn't really matter, but that's the goal of this step and the relative approach hearing model is to simulate the sensitivity of the human hearing system and then reduce all the nonsense that has no impact on what we would actually hear. And if we do not have our noise only reference, that little helper signal that I mentioned earlier, then we'll have to do some estimation later on which is why you can see having the noise only would be helpful because getting an accurate measurement is certainly better than estimating a measurement. And then the final step is we create what we call a compensated reference signal. That reference signal is essentially trying to replicate what the device would sound like if its signal processing is completely linear and time independent and there are no other degradations like noise, etc. cetera, um, present. So once that has taken place, we move into the binaural processing phase. And this is, of course, key because A, humans are binaural, and B, being binaural, we have an ability to improve the signal-to-noise ratio of signals relative to a monaural listening experiment. So we want the algorithm to replicate that. And in this case, we're using something called short-term equalization cancellation the STEC model, where we're doing some fancy spectral component combinations from the left and the right ear. Now, once all that's been done, it's time to extract some metrics. And there's a long list here of eight different metrics that get extracted. The two that I want to highlight for us today is the third point where we talk about the spectral distance between process signal and noise. This is in principle, similar to what's happening in the good old speech intelligibility index, but crucially, in this case, has been extended to now cover real speech and non-stationary background noise scenarios. That was not the case in the days of the SII uh, metric. It is now. And then the fourth one, the ITD, the interoral time difference, this calculation uh, inside the listening effort metric is not done according to the most common definition, and I won't get into the details. This is where I would urge you to go and look at the Etsy standard, TS103558, or if you go to the Head Acoustics website, we have a very detailed application note that likes, likewise will cover a lot more than we can do in this format and in this menu. 
In any case, these eight metrics, what I really want to convey to you is the fact that we're looking at some combination of the, the absolute level of the signal and the noise. We're also looking at that spectral distance. So basically it's a measure of the relevance of the signal to noise ratio, because if the most of the noise content is in a certain area that has no impact or influence on the primary speech components, be they in the frequency domain, then it shouldn't matter too much what the absolute SNR is. And then finally, we also look at the correlation between the device output, which is the degraded signal minus the noise signal, so the process signal of sorts. And we look to see how similar that is to the reference signal to just give us a baseline for how good is this device even performing. Now let's look at what comes out because we take these eight metrics and we add a little tiny ninth metric, which is essentially a flag that just indicates whether we captured the noise only reference or not. And if that flag is raised to say, nope, we did not capture it, then we do a couple extra error compensation steps at the end because we're doing our estimation of the process and the noise signals. Anyway, those metrics get fed into a random forest regression method, which is you know fancy for machine learning, and then uh, using one large part of the auditory test database, we train the model and then we validate the model using another large part of the auditory test database. And the final result is a MOS score that indicates the listening effort for this particular situation. Now, just a quick note, for two primary reasons, there is a final scaling factor that is implemented on the output. And that looks at that process signal, so the degraded minus the noise. And if that process signal is exceeding 94 dB SPL, we start to enter a little bit of a slope that very quickly degrades down to giving us a MOS score of 1.0. The reason for doing that is number one, that increasing the output volume of your device, just indefinitely cranking the volume button up is not going to be a proper solution for anything at all. That's something that, yes, it helps SNR, but it's not going to be a suitable and appropriate way to improve listening effort. Number two, and these are tied together, it's like a two part step here, but since the listening effort metric is based on auditory tests, we cannot subject our test jury members to very, very loud noises and signals for health and obvious health and safety reasons, and certainly not for a long period of time. So number one, there's frankly a lack of data above very those high amplitudes where we can trust what the listening effort metric would be doing because we haven't exposed our jury members to those excessively loud noises. And B, kind of tying back into the first point, you don't want to subject your subjects, your users of your products to those loud noises either. So that's why that scaling is implemented. Now let's take a look at the automotive use case. I think the first thing we want to start with is the in-car communication system. So for obvious reasons, communication inside of a vehicle is often impaired to some extent when the car is moving. Obviously that the movement of the vehicle induces noise, whether that's purely road and wind noise or whether we have a good old fashioned ICE that's generating some noise, that's going to degrade the ability uh, for seamless communication to happen inside the vehicle. And then specifically from the driver's perspective, the driver's head is typically facing straight forward because they want their eyes on the road. And the driver, if they are speaking, are going to be speaking right into the windshield or the steering wheel, basically forward. And the people in the back seat are going to have a much harder time hearing and understanding what the driver is saying. That is especially true for vehicles that contain three rows of seating. So we have these pretty cool systems called in-car communication systems that by the definition uses the integrated microphones and speakers in the vehicle cabin 
to amplify conversations and improve communication between all occupants in a motor vehicle. That seems like a great use case for listening effort. That was the thought as well by Rymus and Luca in 2018, where they conducted an auditory study in two different vehicles at three different driving conditions or noise conditions. One of them was complete silence, one of them was at medium speed, and then one of them at high speed. And they used two different cars, a full-size car indicated by the squares, and then a mid-size car indicated by the triangles. And what they really wanted to do here was to ask people in the car using that uh, DCR category rating to rate the listening effort needed to understand the person in the driver's seat um, as we change the conditions of the test case. So I know it sounds a little bit trivial here, but for the complete silence condition, it's very reassuring to see that the listening effort metric or scaling is providing us pretty much of a, a, a 5.0. It's, it's near perfect. No effort is required in silence conditions. So it acts as a nice anchor condition and gives us some confidence that the listening effort approach is the right approach for an in-car communication system. Now, likewise, for the other two, let's call them noisy scenarios, what we're seeing here is that First of all, the ICC system helps. Again, that gives us some con uh, confidence that the system is working as intended because it bumps up by somewhere around half-ish MOS point when we switch the system from off to the default setting. And then we can play a little bit with the different settings. And again, the reassuring thing is that the same noise scenario tracks very well for the different vehicles and of course again the full-size car scores better than the mid-size car that generally agrees well with the understanding that the full-size car is going to have better mvh properties a better insulation lower overall noise in the in the cabin that's all reassuring and then likewise when you think about this implementation of the icc system in these cars this was developed and tuned prior to something known as listening effort. So this was all done subjectively using lots of auditory uh, jury studies. And that jury study might have been tedious and time consuming, but ended up take, getting us to a system where the listening effort approach essentially agrees with that initial development. So that gives us a lot of confidence when we look across every single use case scenario. So. Listening effort is therefore what we would consider a very suitable metric for evaluating in-car communication systems. Now, in the meantime, ITUT P1150 was standardized, which gives us an overview of how to test these in-car communication systems. And whether you're interested in measuring completely according to P1150 or not, it's still a super useful standard because it has a really good baseline diagram setup terminology and use case described in it, which we should all really adopt when we start talking about automotive applications and audio zones and in-car communication systems, etc. Now, in P1150, what you'll see is that the mandatory test paths always go from the driver's perspective and then to the rear seats. So zone one to three, one to five. And then if you have three rows in your vehicle, you want to capture one to six and one to eight as well. And the way the convention works is the driver is always zone number one, regardless of if you're in a left-hand drive vehicle or a right-hand drive vehicle. And then zone three is always right behind the driver. So assuming we have some symmetry in the cars when they're developed for one driving style or another, we're talking the same language when we say zone one to zone three. Now, very specifically, how do we go about testing and evaluating an in-car communication system? The first step we need to do is we need to do a noise recording. And this driving noise recording process ends up being a multi-channel recording, as you can imagine. I think the, the second step here we mentioned is you need to capture the driver noise signals 
using a binaural headset. Primary reason for that is to adjust uh, for Lombard effect, but it may also be useful if you're designing an ICC system that works from the back seat to the driver location. Now that's beyond P1150, but it's a useful signal to capture for many different reasons. And then the third step is you of course want to capture binaural recordings from a head and torso in one or more passenger positions. In this case, we're going from zone one to zone five. You might want to capture zone three as well. And then we get a little multiple choice option here because we also have to capture this signal at the DUT microphone. So this is the microphone of the in-car communication system. And we can do that in one of two ways. On the left-hand side, we've shown you how to do that using one measurement microphone. In ideally, we would use probably two or even three reference microphones close to the DUT mic. So that's done acoustically, but then on the right-hand side, we show you how to do that electrically or even digitally, because if that in-car communication system is attached to an A2B bus, so instead of a say, sophisticated and heavy wiring harness, it's all on a single uh, coax wire, then we have the ability to capture that directly the noise signal directly from the A2B bus, which we can use later on during the reproduction. So that's a very elegant way of doing it. Now, from the measurement standpoint, the setup here using the acoustic background noise simulation is more the traditional way to do it. We would typically put up your four loudspeakers and a subwoofer in the trunk, and then we would try to equalize at the multiple points of interest. So at a minimum, we would try to equalize at the main microphone position using one, two, or three reference microphones, but then also in the back seat using the binaural location, so the left ear and the right ear of the head and torso of the passenger in zone number five. That would be the absolute minimum requirement. Of course, maybe we want to capture zone three as well, or zone two, and we have multiple options, but this is the minimum. And then the key thing here is we want the noise playback to be synchronized with the measurement. Now, the alternative, again, which is getting into a lot more of an elegant solution, is to use the A to B bus. So if we've already captured the exact noise signal that lives on the ICC mic, we can also inject that back into the A to B bus so that the head unit is thinking that when we're doing our testing and we're measuring the speech coming out of the mouth of the driver in zone one, that there's a ton of noise because the car is driving. Even though if you open the door and listen, there's no noise in the vehicle. It's a little bit absurd to think about, but it's a really cool and neat way to go about testing it. Now, here is a specific example that I want to share with you because um, our consultants had a vehicle in not too long ago where they had the freedom to play with a little lump of clay in terms of an ICC system to try and tune this ICC system. And what we ended up finding out is that the minimum requirement shown on the previous slides was not sufficient at all for our equalization. As you can see here, we went with the acoustic approach of reproducing the background noise. And in order for us to do the multi-point equalization at the in-car communication mic and binaurally in zone number five, we had to go with a very asymmetric loudspeaker arrangement. So we had six satellite speakers inside the vehicle plus the subwoofer in the back. Now you'll notice we had one loudspeaker up front by the driver in the dash. We had one in the footwell over by the passenger in zone two, but then we had three speakers pointing up in the seat of zone two, in the footwell of the back seat, and then over in zone three, again, pointing straight up into the, the roof of the car cabin. And then we had a loudspeaker also in the way back pointing backwards into the rear windshield, and then of course our subwoofer. So it turned out to be a little bit of a, let's call it a goofy setup and very asymmetric, but it ended up working and allowing us to equalize the system. And that then allows us to start to tune the ICC system. And the path that we went down was 
let's go with two different approaches because we can already tell you now, and I'm sure if you guys are working with this, tuning an ICC system is not a trivial task. It is difficult. But what makes things a little bit easier is if you have a nice metric that can very quickly tell you if you're heading the, in the right direction or not. So in P1150, they've come up with five different scenarios, funnily enough, named scenario one, two, three, four, and five. And they represent anything from the stationary scenario where you're not driving, you're idling, the engine is on, and the fan speed is set to low, and then through some city driving and highway driving scenarios, especially scenario five, I don't think we see too often in North America, but in the speed happy uh, regions of the Autobahn in Germany, you can definitely see those types of speeds. Nonetheless, what we ended up doing here was tuning it to two different profiles, two different settings. Let's call them profile A and profile B. And the different approaches ended up giving us very different results and outcomes. And so as we're tuning the system, you can see that at idle, we're able to gain about 0.3 MOS points improvements using our profile B, whereas profile A doesn't really win us anything at all at idle, which maybe is okay because the listening effort is already fairly high. You don't really need a lot of effort to understand people at idle with low fan speed in the driver in the in the rear seat. Now, as we move up through the different noise scenarios, you can see that we basically get equal output until we get to scenario four. That's the 75 miles an hour ish, 120 kilometers an hour speed with medium fan. Here, profile A does significantly better. Whereas now profile B is actually performing worse than switching off the system. That's not good either, but just goes to show this is, this is tricky stuff. And then finally with scenario five, when we're going 160 kilometers now, about hundred miles an hour. Yes, both systems or both profiles perform equally well or equally poorly because they actually perform worse than what you would expect or what we would get when we just switch off the in-car communication system altogether. So a couple of lessons that we learned here is, number one, this is tricky stuff. Number two, having something like the listening effort metric is very, very helpful for this tuning and design process because this moves a lot quicker than bringing in a lot of people into the car and trying to tune this subjectively and manually. We get into a question of um, acoustic fatigue, people listening to loud noises for a long time, they get fed up with that. So it can be really tricky to do this subjectively. Another thing is this particular vehicle did not have an ANC system. We only had an ICC system. And what we found is no matter what we did, no matter which way we tuned this, we are really only able to improve the listening effort by somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4 MOS points. That's still positive. It's still the right direction we want to go, but we are capped. There's a ceiling on how high we can go unless we have an ANC system. And we've also since learned that having an ANC system then allows us to improve that significantly. It sort of works twofold in the fact that it reduces the overall noise in the cabin and it improves the signal to noise ratio, thereby allowing the ICC system basically more signal to work with and lower noise having to deal with. So it, it's a win-win having an ANC system. Unfortunately, we did not have that in this use case. Now, let's look at some other applications for listening effort in vehicles. The first one we want to extract is audio zones. And at its core, what audio zones are is really just the vehicle trying to introduce little bubbles or compartments where each zone, again, we'll refer to the P1150 zone uh, diagram and say zone two is listening to their own content, zone three and zone five in the back seat have their own content going. And the idea is that nobody else should be able to hear what's going on in those individual zones. Now, where does the listening effort metric apply? Let's assume that we have a scenario where drive, the driver is engaged in a phone call in zone one and in zone two, somebody's enjoying some music. Now, if we look at the receive side of the phone call in zone one, the far end is speaking to them, they're picking up their speech, how much is the music being played in zone two impacting the effect of the phone call, the quality and the intelligibility of the phone call in zone one? That's really the question we're asking. And even taking a step back, 
We can simply just, of course, use listening effort to evaluate the ambient noise in the vehicle, road noise, wind noise, tire noise, engine noise, if an engine exists, on the impact of the receive side of the phone call. But certainly with audio zones, it presents a whole new challenge. Example number two, we're going to basically draw on the situation where we have like a taxi cab or limousine service. There might be a partition between the front seats and the back seats and the driver would like to have a private conversation but we can apply the listening effort to somebody sitting in the rear seat to see how easy is it for that person to detect not only the far end which in theory with the audio zone is fairly localized but even also the near end speech of the driver up in zone one so we're talking about using the listening effort metric as a gauge for privacy. And this is not just in vehicles, this is any type of, let's say, you know, mobile handset speakerphone applications where you don't want somebody to easily hear what's taking place on that phone call. And then just a quick note here, if we stay in the ITU domain, ITU TP1120, which is the super wideband hands-free performance recommendation, there is a note in there that says if a vehicle has implemented audio zones, then the hands-free performance must be the same for all audio zones, i.e. both the sending and the receiving direction has to work just as well, regardless of whether you're the driver, the co-driver, or you're sitting in zone three behind the driver or in zone five. So as we start to see super wideband rollout as we start to see people adopting P1120, audio zones becomes more important and listening effort becomes a crucial step in evaluating the receive direction in each of those individual zones. Now let's take a different scenario, the one about active noise cancellation. So in a previous online seminar, we talked about using the ABLE metric, assessment of binaural listening effort, to evaluate ANC headsets. And that's a fairly well-established practice um, where we can easily judge how well the ANC system is working. In a vehicle, things are a little bit more complex and a little bit more difficult, not only from implementing an ANC system perspective, but also from a test perspective the background noise simulation has to be a lot more accurate simply because we're a lot farther away with our speakers, our loudspeakers, relative to the ears of the person in question, the zone in question, like the driver. And unfortunately, not all ANC systems work like the headphone ANC systems, which are purely acoustic systems. Many ANC systems today are implemented where we extract other sensory data from the vehicle. And that could be things like uh, engine speed from the CAN bus or using flex ray or even accelerometers to get vibration information in the car, etc. But all those signals can be recorded from the different buses in the vehicle. And then if we can inject those back into the system itself, then we can get the vehicle into the correct state where we trigger the correct application of A and C. And of course, that's all combined with the traditional acoustic because of course there's noise in the vehicle too. Now, the A and C, if you can do it right, of course, this is a challenge as well, but if you do it right, it can be hugely beneficial. And as I touched on earlier, specifically with ICC systems, if you have a dedicated ANC system, we can break through that ceiling of about 0.4 MOS point improvements and we can see much, much greater performance out of an ICC system. So definitely consider looking at both in tandem if you're, if you're experimenting with ICC systems. Now, with that, I'd like to just sum up and leave you with our key takeaway points. The first one is that Listening effort, we've determined, is a very suitable metric for evaluating a lot of different acoustic properties in a vehicle. The, the first one and sort of the strongest use case here is the ICC system. And then there are a lot of different new applications and use cases like ANC, like audio zones, where the listening effort metric is 
at surface value a very useful metric that people are experimenting with and the standards are also looking at, for instance, P1120. Now, P1150, of course, is a great template to use for those that are getting into in-car communication systems, and it also specifically points to listening effort. And throughout this online seminar, I've used listening effort and ABLE, the assessment of binaural listening effort, a little bit interchangeably. Uh, the ABLE terminology is basically our head acoustics product name for an aqua option. So if you have an aqua system, that's what you would be getting. But they're essentially one and the same. Now, from a noise field perspective, you know, we have some requirements on how to reproduce the noise, and we can do that acoustically using the three pass flex system. And we have a method for doing that. I don't think that's anything super new for most people, but the elegant and really cool way of doing things going forward is to use the A2B bus. So that, of course, is dependent on the vehicle that you're using and testing and designing using the A2B bus. But if we have that, it unlocks a whole bunch of potential for how to test and tune and uh, design the audio experience in a vehicle. And then the last point here is we try to really uncover a lot of the inner workings of the listening effort metric. I would, of course, refer you to the Etsy standard, TS103558, as well as the application note on the Head Acoustics website, because this is not the format or the venue to get into those hairy details, but there's a lot in there. And if you understand the listening effort metric, it's going to make it maybe a little bit more um, easy to understand why you're getting the scores you're getting when you are testing. So with that, just a final reminder, we have a microsite dedicated to a lot of this content that's going up there. Uh, there's a white paper and there's access to online seminar videos. And then a reminder, November 19, we're doing another online seminar. It's specifically geared towards automotive applications. So I think maybe most of the people attending today would find a lot of that useful and interesting. So we hope to see you on November 19. We'll send more info in due time. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Be safe, everybody, and we hope you enjoyed the session today. Thanks a lot.